so when I look at this, uh, this jump program by Project Pure Athlete, which focuses a lot on jump technique, there's a lot that I know biomechanically about jump technique that I like to teach and bring to players. But I know that if I spend 100 bucks on this course, I get that knowledge for the rest of my life. You know, like the rest of my life. What's up, Brandon? Marky Mark. How we doing? You know, hey. It's almost, it's almost Christmas. It's almost Christmas. We are filming this in the bitter end of 2021. <laughs> <laughs> the bitter end. And uh, yeah, I'm excited. I'm in New York. We just ran our, our second day of, of clinicking. And uh, not as big a showing as the first one. We had to, like everybody at the first one was like, you got to do this again. You got to do this again. So come on. And then uh, we only had like, we had nine signups for the first session and four signups for the second one because we only did it two days in advance. But we had a great crew. We had eight people this morning who we worked a lot on attacking and looking. And it was it was a really good session. I love when you get to work with like small groups and then you have the extra hours to really like dig into problems and see those improvements happen. Um, it was it was a really nice session. So uh, shout out to my to my guys from New York uh, and endless summer volleyball in Oceanside for for hosting us. That's awesome. I'm glad you guys were able to get out there for two. It was two days, right? Well, this was the second yeah. day. First day was two sessions, and then today was just one session. Uh, yeah. So today, um, today we had one session, one three-hour session, and then on last Saturday, what, the new format of our clinics for anybody who is is interested uh, in our clinics. Basically, we we have three sessions in one day, a Saturday. And we do a ball control and passing clinic. Uh, we do a defensive strategies, uh, technique and tactics. And then we do a lot of approach and arm swing work. And, and we, we include some vision into that. So that's what we did last Saturday. And, uh, it, you know, we, it was packed. And I was like, you know, we might be able to do this again if you guys are interested. So can you all throw up your hands? And everybody threw up their hand. And so two days later, we built out the clinics, sent it out. And we only ended up with like 11 sessions or... 12, 11 or 12 people um, across two sessions. So I was like, you know what, guys, we're just going to pull this into one session. And uh, yeah, we had a great little morning run. So I was uh, pretty stoked. And just, you know, it's always awesome just to work with people who just want to get better, mm -hmm. <laughs> who are actually like putting in the work, who, who want to learn and are, and are kicking butt. So, um, so good. So good. yeah, I like that, and especially and even like small group like that. It's great because then you get into all the individualized coaching. Like you give them the main theme, and then you can start like giving each person their own little nugget. And like that's uh, whenever you can walk away from those, that's that's like a pretty big thing. Because like a lot of times we don't think about it, but it's like one little piece of advice can win you hundreds, if not thousands, of more points. Like within a single season. You know, so like that little idea of just being able to see the blocker, see the defender, whatever it is, even if it was something simpler with just being on time with your attack or something like that, um, that one little fix can can win you so many more points, which I, I think a lot of times we forget about that. Yeah, right. Is, it, isn't it? You know, I'm I'm looking at a because I'm a fan of a couple of Instagram accounts right now that are doing like good things with jump programs, um, like Project Pure Athlete. Uh, I want to check out uh, Sam Pedlo's platform um, and and Dustin Watton's his courses, and but I'm like, you know what? These these guys have worked decades to be able to master. They found their own path. They they have seen things that you and I haven't seen. You know, they ended up at the same level, but it's they've they've ended up at levels beyond us. Um, but along that way, because they've had different teachers, different coaches, they get to see different things. They get to hear different things. And so when I look at this uh, this jump program by Project Pure Athlete, which focuses a lot on jump technique, there's a lot that I know biomechanically about jump technique that I like to teach and bring to players, but I know. And if I spend a hundred bucks on this course, I get that knowledge for the rest of my life. 
you know, like the rest of my life. And if you measure just times per use when you're thinking about a small course like that, it's like, why, why wouldn't you? If it's up your alley, if it's something that you want to learn and you know is going to benefit you and the people around you in the long run, a hundred bucks is absolutely nothing. Uh, compared to the amount of times you're going to use that knowledge instead of just kind of continuing it and, and putting your own information on repeat. I have a, I used to meet these coaches when I was like a cocky young coach, like 24, 25, who would, they were like, yeah, I've been coaching for 30 years. I, I know this. How do you come in and say all oh, this is different? I'm, just because you've been doing something for 30 years does not mean you've been doing it at an, at a high level for 30 years, Right. It means and, that you've been doing most, it and no one has taken your place. <laughs> right. And most of the time, if you're doing the same thing for 30 years, you've fallen behind the times, you know, like, it's, and like when we're thinking about beach volleyball, like the game has changed so much in the last five years, but we still have coaches that are coaching the same, the way that they were taught how to coach, you know, mm -hmm. and, or the way that they were taught how to play. Um, and like a lot of times I'll even have people ask me like, um, so you're, you, you're obviously you coach, you're a good coach. Do you still get coached by other people? And my answer is always 100%. Like I am always looking to find a, a good coach to take me in, you know, like I want someone to still coach me because that's the time where I might have someone say something to me that I, I haven't heard it said that way before, or mm -hmm. I might hear an idea that, haven't really thought about too much. So, um, like, it's always kind of funny, like if I'm coaching someone in Hermosa and they're like, Hey, I think I'm going to, I'm going to go to a session with this person next week. And they like, think that I'm going to be like a little offended. And I'm like, no, Hey, go get coached by as many people as you possibly can. As long as you're learning, that's like, that's the best part. Yeah. Um, because I mean, that's, that's what we're doing too, you know? So it's hard to, it's hard to kind of, <laughs> say, Hey, right. only come to us. <laughs> um, but you know, there's, there's, there's like a couple of things in there. I don't think that you should bounce around to coaches like each practice. I think you have to see oh, yeah, a coach's yeah, yeah. plan out consistency stick with, yeah, stick with them and know where, know where you're headed. Mm -hmm. Follow the plan for long enough to actually grab onto something and then see if that plan goes because I mean, some coaches can provide things in one session, but there's so much value in hanging around that because you only get to say so much in two hours. And a good coach knows I'm not going to put my entire library of knowledge into you in these two hours. I'm going to give you the one thing that you need the most right now. Mm -hmm. But that's that's a nowhere near like what they have to offer. And that might become a bigger part of that grand scheme. Like, well, in order to do this, okay, now we're going to have to build up. We're going to have to break everything down and rebuild it. You know, you, we talk about like Tiger Woods, who still has a coach, right? Like was the world's greatest golfer. Uh, Tom Brady, who still has um, his, his own body mechanics. It's, it's apparent that Tom Brady doesn't actually need a coach. Uh, to... <laughs> right. <laughs> Shout out to the Pats fans out there. Right. Um but like all of the best players still have coaches, still have body workers, still have nutritionists. And it's not that they don't know how, it's just that putting that in the hands of somebody else um, to sort of drive the boat is just a better way to do it. Um, I'm reading a book right now called The One Thing. It's a really good business book. And it talks about how multitasking is not a skill that should be like promoted or asked for or searched for. It's the ability to focus and narrow things down to say, what's the most important thing I can do this week? If you had to lock it down to one thing, and do you have the ability to stay in there for the 40 hours that week and like perfect that instead of seeing all of the different problems and flashing signs and new ideas and people are coming into you and then you're like, we're sitting here uh, doing work on the website. And then all of a sudden you get a notification on Instagram and then somebody, you know, is interested in one of our courses or wants to come to a camp, but they have a problem with booking. Well, now I, I spend like 10 seconds disengaging from this one task to, to take care of that task. And then I forget where I leave off. And then finally to get back into that rhythm, that's going to take me just another bout of time. It's like when you're, when you're lifting or you're playing pool play, right. On a Saturday, 
you need to warm up again for your second pool play match to get yourself engaged. And your brain works that way too. And so being able to focus on one thing for a long time um, is, is a big skill that this book is talking about. I'm really enjoying it so far because uh, I know that my brain goes from idea to idea to idea to idea and I need to lock it in. And I think our players should be able to do that as well. Can you focus on passing for one month? Right. Yeah, that's where I was getting ready to go with it. It's like that that skill doesn't just happen on a daily basis. You know, it's like something that we've been doing in Hermosa. Is, and and it's tough when, when you're running like group classes and stuff like that. But um, we have the first week of a month is a certain skill. The second week of a month is a certain skill, you know, and it's like every single class during that week, the drills might be a little different, but the skill focus is always going to be the same, you know, and it's hard. It's hard as a player to be like, Oh my gosh, like here's my fourth practice of the week on passing. But the really cool thing about that is like, you're 100% going to see improvement. Um, and then the same thing for coaches, you know, I think it's very, very hard for a coach because it's no secret that every single player enjoys playing more than they like drilling. Mm-hmm. To an extent, you know, there are some people out there that are like, no, I want to drill, 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 drill. Like, I don't care if we don't get to any gameplay. No. But for the most part, it's hard for like inexperienced coaches. They're like go into the practice. And even if they have a plan, they're like, you know what? Today we're going to work on ball control. We're going to work on passing. And then within 30 minutes, they're like, ah, oh, these guys are starting to lose focus or, or these these people. Let's go ahead and play king of the court. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, and then they're like, Ooh, people are working hard. People are diving. People are out of breath. I've had to take three water breaks, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's like, Oh man, like now this is a good practice. When yeah. at the end of the month, like, I don't know if you're necessarily seeing like, yes, they're probably, they're definitely getting better because they're consistently playing, but mm. I don't think that they're seeing the growth that they would if they chose a specific topic and focus on that for a week, two weeks, a month, if you have the time. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, being able to slow down and kind of see that is, is definitely something that you should start thinking about. hundred percent, hundred percent, man. And, um, while we're talking about focus, let's, let's bring in today's topic. Yeah. <laughs> something that I think too many people ignore and can do better is just the simple standing float surf. I mean, you can be, the title of our thing today is lethal. You can be absolutely lethal with a good variation of standing float serves. And most people kind of, they don't use enough variation, I think, in their float serves. And uh, putting the ball over and to a certain person becomes like where this person's uh, serve knowledge or exploration of the skill ends. It just ends in, yeah, I can get it over, sometimes harder, sometimes a little bit left or right. And that's it's really not good enough uh, to hit the next level. And one of the biggest things that I see is players choose a person, and that's it. They say, okay, we're serving that person. And that's as far as their strategy goes. And it's, okay... But if they get a good pass, what's your next step? Is it like, oh, my God, our entire plans have been foiled. (laughs) And now you have no idea, like, what to do. (laughs) Dang it, they're ready to play this sport, too. (laughs) Yeah, and I think it's a a simple question. Like, when if you're back there serving, like, those people are thinking, oh, this is how I start the point. Mm -hmm. But I think that that question needs to change in your mind a little bit to be to realizing that this is your first opportunity to win the point. Yes. You know, like a serve is an is a is a way for you to start earning points and like and it doesn't always have to be an ace. But if you can start thinking about putting that other team in trouble then that that's a good thing. I think a lot of times if people are only thinking about aces, that leads to a lot of errors. But if you Mm -hmm. think about putting that person in trouble for that other team with some something that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, then that's that's always going to start off the point a little bit better. 
And we're going to get into a lot of that today. And uh, I'm going to ask for, for your best float serve tips. I'm going to give mine. And then I, I really would like to uh, talk about strategy and what each style of serve does as well. So I'll start my first one. Uh, and uh, you can tell me if you like it, love it, or hate it. Um, here's, here's where I kind of picked this up. I started looking at Todd Rogers, and every now and then he would make some type of interesting shape with his hands, like an, an almost okay sign where he would like close it. Every now and then I was always wondering, like, was he fisting some of his serves? And I started looking at my serves and where I was contacting it and how I was contacting it. And I started thinking about surface areas. And one of the answers that I came upon was the consistency of the different places in your hands when you strike a float serve is crucial. Now, like if you hit the middle of your hand on a float serve, or if you hit the upper part, like the calluses on your, just below your fingers, that's going to have a significantly different bounce or impact than say like your palm or the heel of your palm. And if you don't focus on those small parts of your hand, right? and being able to contact the same surface each time, because each part of your hand is quite different. Uh, if you don't contact at the right surface, you're going to have a very different serve each time. The ball's going to come off of you at a different speed when you're serving. And that means that now, like, let's go back to firearms, Brandon, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> why not? We, we avoided it last, last time, so why not be back there this time? <laughs> now you've got a gun where whenever you squeeze the trigger, uh, the bullets are all just coming out at different speeds. And it's going to be impossible to be accurate with this type of weapon, right? So when we talk about serving, if you hit some here and some like in a different part of your hand, you know that they're going to come out with different speeds. So if you don't focus on hitting a very specific part of your hand, you're going to have trouble being accurate over time. So the key that I like to give people, of course, is uh, from Kyle Stevenson. Shout out to Kyle Stevenson. Uh, okay. <laughs> hamburger. No French fries. You know, make sure you're using the palm, but I, I went even more specific on it. Of course, you can't have fingers on the ball. Just when you're float serving, do not let your fingers touch the ball. But keeping the base of, like, right above the heel of your palm, you know, just that bottom part where it's going to be have a nice crispy bounce. I don't want people serving with their wrists or anything, but to just have that base of your palm where that becomes the area that I hit every time, I know that the ball is going to come off at different speed. And I like that better than the middle of my hand because I think since the ball has a sharper bounce off of that area, there's just this 1% that I look at that I say the defense isn't going to have quite the same read the time to read as it, as they would on a softer piece of my hand where the ball will come off a little bit slower so that they're going to have uh, a little bit more time, right? I want the ball to get out of my hand quick and start gaining distance before they pick up on the trajectory of it. So one of my biggest, biggest, biggest keys is to really focus on just above the heel of your palm. That's where I want my float serves contacted. Um, and that's, that's, that's how I start most of my service teachings but wh yeah. wh where were you taught like as far as your hand placement on the ball for floats you know i've uh I, I like the specific point I've, I've never really talked too much about where on the hand like i love you and i have used the hamburger no french fries <laughs> thing quite a bit and i i love that and now we're milking it at this point or whatever <laughs> Um, because it, it really gives a good idea and it's Kyle. So it's like, you just love saying anything Kyle says. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but something I saw a video, I can't remember who it was. It, I think it was just a high school coach, um, at somewhere where he was talking to his girls and he was talking about a float serve and something that he had all of his kids do is clap and then clap without using your fingers. Mm. And that I think that that teaching allows a lot of people to kind of understand how this hand needs to feel when they're making contact with the ball. Um, I think a lot of people go into a serve, a float serve, where they maybe they lack power or something like that, and they never really get to this extended hand open position. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I like something that I've been teaching recently, and especially if you're if you're lacking that kind of ping that you're that you were talking about before, where the ball doesn't come off with speed or something like that, then more than likely your hand is in a position where it's a little soft, mm -hmm. you know? And then once we do that, that's when it's, it, it's kind of weird. You're paint brushing some balls. You're, you're not able to hit the ball in the same spot of your hand every single time. Um, so that's developing inconsistencies. But yeah, I think, I think as long as you have that strict hand and now we're focusing on where we're going to contact, because if you're getting your fingers out of the way, you're not going to want to contact the ball up here because those those fingers don't have any action. Right. Um, if you're here, then it, you're going to be okay with touching the ball with every single part of your hand. Um, but yeah, I think if you can go back here and then now what you're talking about, about focusing on a specific point on the hand, I think that that's a really good conversation to have because to be honest, I've had the conversation before where I'm like, you know what, you just need to have a solid hand. And I can't really help you too much with your hand contact. You know, like that's something that you kind of have to figure out on your own. You know, like I can tell you the mechanics, but like the actual touching of the ball, like that, that's going to be on you. But I think if we as coaches can provide a little bit more, like giving them that whole aim small, miss small thing, you know, um, if yeah. we give them that idea of being like, hey, try to hit here. Like even if you happen to be a little inconsistent on this thing and you have that hand in the right, right form then you're obviously going to find that serve a little bit easier. So I really like that. That's good. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. yeah. I like it. That's a thought. Yeah. What do you, um, so, you know, um, we're getting people out of using their fingers. And yes, you do see that people who even who aren't trying to use their fingers, like this just sort of gets in the way just because of that lack of that focal point right at the very beginning of the serve. And mm -hmm. that's the most important thing is, is going to be that aim especially when we're talking about float surfs. Yeah. So, um, cool. What's yeah, your next so I, I piece like of that. I, I had a hand contact written down as well. Um, when something else I have written down is a strong setup and a meaningful setup. Hmm. Okay. And what I mean by that is like knowing what your other body positions need to be before you start. Um, if we're talking about a standing float serve, then something I, I would like for people to do a little bit more is get there if i'm right-handed then my left foot needs to be closer to the line than my right um i like to have my left foot pointing towards the net and then my right foot will kind of be at a little maybe a 45 degree angle um mm -hmm. if not a 90 degree angle um which allows me to kind of push off that back foot um, once you have that solid base of your feet then it allows you to kind of rock back and forth to allow yourself to give a little momentum. Um, I think one of the big struggles that we see is that when, especially people, if you're a person that questions your strength of being able to get the ball over the net, um, a lot of the times what we see is that people are actually leaving the ground with that back foot and they're kind of rotating with their, with their swing. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes sense when you think about it, like when you see it, it's like, oh, you're trying really hard to get the ball over the net, but we don't realize that, you know, when you have your feet planted on the ground and you have that left foot forward and you have that right foot as your base and you're doing that rocker step, having that strength of your feet being on the ground is the power that you're looking for. You know, when you're moving, when you're rotating through this hit, you're taking the power away from your legs. You're taking the power away from your actual arm swing because now you're just kind of evening it out. Yep. Um, so you're actually making your job a little bit harder. So my yeah, second your thing, obliques aren't stretching. Exactly. If your whole body twists at once, there's no stretch sequence in your body and you can't fire those rubber bands. Right. Yeah. So I would say a strong, a strong base and then, and just trusting those feet. So I, I think we'll kind of work our way up, but, um, yeah, if we can, if we can keep those feet into a good starting position and then allow us to use that momentum while keeping our feet grounded, mm -hmm. um, I think that that'll sure up some consistencies and that, and that's once again, that's mainly for people who I think are, um, not trusting their strength, you know, yeah. and if you have a lot of inconsistencies on where you're serving, like if you're trying to serve a right sideline and you happen to always serve it to the left side of the court, more than likely you're doing that rotation too. Yeah. Some people can't get that ball over the net and they don't believe that they can. 
And I haven't had anyone leave a serving session with me without getting a ball over the net from the service line. You know, they always come into it saying like, I can't do it. I just don't have the power. I just don't have the strength. And it always comes down to, to one of these two things. Like, are your feet positioned in a good way? Are you actually utilizing them so that you put your roots in the ground and then you can utilize some stretch? And what part of your hand are you hitting? Mm-hmm. Like, those things combined with what's going to be our next key will get everybody their first serve over the net. And all you have to do is just start somebody from half court and then move them back piece by piece. And once you fix those things, like that contact point, there's some people that won't use their open hand. They use their fist because you can just use the harder part of your hand. But now their, their whole hand is hard because they use their fist, right? So the last thing that I, that I think most people can work on, and this comes in with the swing, is this ability to open up their shoulders and get a little bit of stretch in the oblique. So if I'm sitting in a chair, you guys are at home, you're sitting in a chair. If you can keep your knees forward, but rotate so that your shoulder gets 90 degrees backwards, right? That's that thoracic rotation that we're talking about. And what's happening there is you're stretching your obliques. And once you stretch your obliques, they help you fire forward, okay? So a lot of what we tell, especially beginners, is to just wave hello to somebody behind them and then come forward. Right. It's it works great with kids, with adults. Just getting somebody to get their hand back is important. We have uh, our video editor, Tanya, who struggles with some overhead throwing motions and things like that. She's got a little she's tight as far as mobility goes. And I thought you did something excellent with her, because when we did this, hello, getting her hand up a lot, she didn't she wasn't quite able to use that stretch sequence. So it froze her. And then you did one of the most amazing things uh, in coaching I've ever seen that gave her the power. You said, you know what? You're just going to touch this point. So you had her start, like the first person that I've seen where you had her start with her hitting arm down by her side, completely relaxed in jello. And then you said, toss, then load, then go. Mm-hmm. And that gave her this fast stretch and release uh, momentum, I guess we'll say. It, and it finally gave her some power on her float serve. So she was still going to this key of waving hello to somebody behind her, right? But the touch and go speed of it by having her hand down by her side, I'm not saying that this is a solution for everybody, but it's one of the most unique solutions that I've ever seen. And like kudos to you for finding that. Um, to have somebody relax enough so that they're not so stiff and that they can use the stretch sequences in their body. And so kind of the third third thing that we can teach players to do is to open up, to wave that hand hello, to kind of twist it. That gives, when I wave hello, you give that little extra stretch in your muscles, a little extra forearm you stretch know, that allows your elbow to rotate. And before you keep going, this little, I think uh, one of the big things with her, with Tanya, when I was working with her, is that I think a lot of people, they get too stressed in this position, mm-hmm. you know? and this if you're in this position right now at home when you're when you're watching if your hand is forward then this bicep tends to tighten up a little bit you know but if you put if you wave behind you now this bicep's loose Mm -hmm. okay and so i think like a lot of times when we're talking about get that arm back and ready and loaded so we're getting rid of one possible movement before the serve happens but if you don't have the ability to find that relaxation point to allow that fire to happen, then then that's that's probably one of the struggles there. So I think that's kind of like what I picked up on with Tanya. Yeah, it was a good find. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, third, third, everybody, is just be able to turn that hand back. You can do it with your shoulders so that you rotate away from your hips. And you can also do it by a little rhomboid activation, in other words, squeezing your shoulder blades back together. That helps you get another two to three inches of open space but if you do this by locking and holding and then you're never able to relax and find a whip motion even if it's a small slow whip people think that you're kind of like stiff on float serves but there's still a sequence it's still elbow to hand where the hand comes through after the elbow and that is a stretch and if you can relax just a little bit in that rotator cuff to allow the elbow to come through before the hand, you're going to get that nice pop on the float surf. Um, and for sure, you'll be able to get it over the net. Um, and if you haven't been able to get your surf over the net as an overhand server, 
just come to one of our camps or clinics. <laughs> we'll get you and we'll stick with it because it drives me insane if I can't get somebody to hit it over the net. And I, I stick on that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, and I think a lot of the time, um, we will continue going in a second, but I think a lot of times coaches and players are too focused on the result of a play when they're trying mm -hmm. to learn something, you know, a serve, like if you walk into a, a practice and you're learning how to overhand serve and you think about every miss serve as a failure, you're going to drive yourself crazy, you know? So yeah. it's this idea of finding, there is a form, there's a form to everything. And it, there's a unique form to you too, as a player. Um, but finding that form, it's not failures, you know, it's like every single every single thing that you fail at is making you into a better player. Same thing as life, you know, it's definitely mm -hmm. a life lesson. Um, but I think a lot of times like we can be like, Oh, you know what? I didn't make the serve over, but my feet stayed on the ground. I had a good setup. I just missed the hand contact a little bit. So then the next time you focus on all those things that you did right. And now you add in the hand contact. Um, so I think it's, if we can have that kind of growth mindset, that would be really good too. We had a, a couple of players in our online courses uh, who took our Fix Your Arm Swing course in 21 days. And they started out, I mean, just needing to try to pump and like jump into their float serves and, and do that whole jump and twist that you're saying. And serving is so inconsistent. And mm -hmm. we, with their video, because uh, for those of you who don't know, with our online programs, our online coaching, uh, when you join our team, you get to post all of your videos. We give you the drills to do weekly. Uh, you can choose any course you want, but our group moves together uh, with a different course at a different time. So right now they're finishing up the attacking course. This should be the last day of the attacking course. And most of the players aren't using courts, but we had two of these players who were just doing that jump float serve. And all it took was us just taking a look at film they post on our private Facebook group. We slow it down frame by frame and we say, look at the sequence. That's not happening, right? Everything's coming through at the exact same time. So there's never a stretch uh, in the body. And we got people who took our online classes, not even our in-person classes, our online classes. And they're, well, you know, coming back to the meetings and be like, I got aces this weekend. I was crushing people <laughs> so from the cool. service line. And it's so satisfying, you know, yeah. to, to like, Joe, who's now leading the way there, and uh, earlier when I was running every meeting, it was so nice to hear our online members come back from that and just be like, yes, I'm literally winning more points because they're drills I'm doing at home and the videos that we're watching together. So uh, a little shout out to our, to our online coaching group there, but you can do it. If you think you can't overhand serve, you can do it. Just keep trying. Don't just go underhand serve because you think you're not strong enough. You need to develop the pathways that make it happen. And then when you need help after that, then we're here for you for some online video coaching. Um, and you can find that at betterbeach.com forward slash coaching. If you're ever interested in joining our uh, personal online coaching group, then you are more than welcome and we can work on your arm swing no matter what level you're at. Yeah. And especially if you're one of those people too, that's uh, like another, I don't want to call it an excuse because it definitely is an excuse for some people, but uh, my shoulder hurts more than likely. Like, yes, if your shoulder hurts that bad, you need to go see somebody. You need to get checked out to make sure you haven't torn anything, mm -hmm. but more than likely if your shoulder hurts from an overhand serve, it's probably because you're doing something wrong. You're yep. adding in an extra movement or you're doing, you're making your body move in a certain way that it does not want to. So if you're one of those people, if you have shoulder pain, but you don't think you have anything torn, more than likely it's a technique issue. Um, so we can fix you too. <laughs> um, <laughs> just takes a little bit of guidance and just hearing something in a different way and then sticking to it. Right. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the great part about having coaches, having a group of players that like you can train with is that accountability and knowing that like, Hey, we're not going to get mad at you if you miss, but you got to mm -hmm. get this. Yeah. You know? Um, I'll, uh, are we keep, are we keeping the train rolling? Yeah. I, I, I want to hear uh, a little, cause I want to get into some strategy. Okay. Course. So, so my, uh, my, one of my last two, I have two more written down. Um, yeah. one of them is a concentrating on the lift of the ball. And 
most people would call it a toss, but I think when we tell people to toss the ball for their serve, um, we get a lot of wrist action and a lot of elbow bend, which puts some topspin on that ball and it creates some consistency. So something mm -hmm. that I like to think about is right when you, when you get to that position where you're set up, so kind of going back to my first key that I was talking about, having those strong legs, present the ball, you know, present the ball out in front of you like you're showing it off to the world and then when you are lifting it you don't have to bend your elbow or bend your arm or your wrist it doesn't have to be a toss um whenever we get into jump serving and stuff like that that's when we're going to start tossing because we're going to need that ball to develop some top spin before we go but i think if you're thinking about a consistent powerful float serve the first thing and a lot of people will say it the most important thing is the toss. Um, there's a lot of important things, but whenever we're doing it, present that ball, give that ball a nice, easy lift up into your hitting window, and then that'll allow you to go through and strike. And when that ball leaves your hands, uh, if you think about if you're able to stand up at home, when you extend your arm, it will probably be about a couple inches in front of that front foot. Um, and if you lift that ball up perfectly, it should land right in front of that front toe. Um, maybe a little bit, but we want to make sure that we're able to use that momentum going forward. Definitely. So mine would be concentrate on that toss. Don't throw it too high. Don't throw it too low. Like we have the Chris Vaughn serve is still like one of the weirdest things for me to watch because it's a very consistent serve for him but like yep. i can't imagine teaching that to somebody because it requires perfect timing if you haven't mm. seen chris vaughn serve he literally Toss and float. tosses and serves yeah you know and it's and it's super consistent for him but like we need to find that nice little happy medium where it's high enough to where you have time to react but it's not super high to where you're waiting mm -hmm. and it's not low enough to where you're like not getting it at the right contact point yeah, and I'll add one thing to your toss uh, that I we see in just beginner and B players, the people who squat and use every leg muscle they have to toss a volleyball, <laughs> twelve inches. It's it, heavy, dude. It's <laughs> yeah. You don't need the bend and snap. You don't need a full squat to toss a ball for a flanding, standing float serve right? Just leave that soft bend in your legs and lift the ball with just your arms. You don't need all of that leg rhythm. So if you guys film yourself at home or at your next practice or game, and you see yourself tossing your float serve with one hand for a standing float serve, and you have to bend all the way down, and then you toss it in order to do that, you're doing too much. Simplify the process and just go with an arm lift. The ball's not that heavy. It's quite light, actually. It's quite light. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, any more keys that you want to talk about? Or are you, are you ready I for talk, I want to talk a little bit about strategy. Okay, let's do it. Yeah. Um, so I always teach that there are essentially four different styles of float surf, right? You got the heater the one where you put little ping on it and you're trying to get it across the net as flat as possible and as fast as possible. This serve naturally is going to land deep in the court. It's gonna land deep, but I'm not going to consider it a deep serve. And you guys will hear why in a little bit. But that flat, fast serve is designed to have speed and it's designed to make the other person panic. Now you can either throw it right at their neck and force them into a tomahawk situation or make them have to get out of the way or you can throw it down like in the middle their their seam or down their sideline right but there has to be ping on it and it has to be intentionally flat when you put arc on that then you're getting rid of the, the whole goal of the flat fast float surf right fast so thank you <laughs> got through it <laughs> yeah nice job so putting ping and we keep using this word ping like zip whatever you want to say it's got to be accelerated through that tape pick a spot you know six inches right above the tape and fire it through so that it might take somebody's head off right you know i had a uh i had a, just to kind of clarify that a little bit i had a coach in slovakia that we couldn't talk but he had me going like i was the only pro on the team 
that was international. So I had to go in for an extra practice to like meet my contract. And mm -hmm. some, one of the most consistent things that he had me do, which I've definitely carried over to the beach is he would put up a, a rubber band, like a, from the top of the antenna on one side to the top of the antenna on the other side. Yes. And I wasn't allowed to leave practice until I hit my serve through that band, like through the, between the net and that band and then landing in the back three feet of the court. Um, and I had to do it like, 10 times or something like that. Um, but I think especially if you can create that visual, where it's something that I'll, I'll say to a lot of beginners or intermediates who are having trouble with this, is if you can draw that line at the top of the antenna to the other antenna and create a, pretty much another box above the net, act like it's filled with glass. And it's your job to break that glass. Ooh, I like um, that. I think if we can break that glass, then you're going to be surprised on the amount of serves that you're able to miss deep. Um, if you do miss a serve deep, it's probably because you hit it above that glass. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're able to hit that zone and it, if, if it's hard and it's flat and it's float serve, um, <laughs> then it's, it's, it's going to be like probably the best serve that you have the ability to do. It's going to help you with strength and it's going to make that passer have to react quickly. So I think yeah. that, that that visual helps a lot with a lot of players I've worked with. I love that. To break that that pane of glass, uh, I'm going to steal that. That's good. Steal away. Okay, so that flat, flat fast float serve <laughs> designed to beat somebody, make them panic, and make them rush, right? It's, it's to create float on the ball. The float will naturally happen. Um, but you have to put some zing on it in order to put that pressure. Now, my number two serve once you've done that enough times and this is where like if you guys are baseball fans you're going to understand this analogy but to have the exact same trajectory so create that exact line but you do hit the ball softer so that after you've gotten them so used to that speed and they're expecting it to come fast at them this ball just loses its speed and then right after the net kind of drops down. And this was a really hard concept for me to get because Fred Chow at, at George Mason, he tried to get me to understand this. And I was like, how's the ball just going to stop? He's like, it just kind of hits a curtain and it just falls down. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense <laughs> to me. But eventually I was able to really understand it and to just slow down the arm a little bit or hit. Uh, a smaller piece of the ball. So instead of following through too much, you just kind of touch the edge of it, right? That ball will still go on that line, but just enough after the net. And this takes so much practice. You have to practice the serve that it just looks like it's coming at your head and then it dives. And then you see passers literally diving forward to make a pass, right? And if you can get a serve receiver diving, you've definitely won the first battle. Right, because you'd rather be on a knee. You want to pass with your hands above your hips. We know that from from all of our serve receive talk. But having that, and I call it the dead ball, where it just drives and then poof, just kind of fades to the ground, and somebody kind of has to jerk forward and dive for that ball. It is such an effective serve, but you just can't use that serve over and over again. It works like a changeup in baseball where you get somebody on their heels and then all of a sudden you show the same arm swing, the same line, but it's, it is just moving slower and it's hard for the eyes to really pick up on that and detect it. And that oddly enough is sometimes I will change the surface of my hand contact and I'll keep my arm speed the same in order to do this. So I'll strike that one maybe in the middle of my palm and that will get me to the point where, okay, I can keep the same arm speed. So I'm not giving anything away. And then I'll have a, um, that, that dead ball come in and that works much like a circle change up, uh, in baseball, where instead of grabbing the seams with your two fingers, you would put the ball in the middle of your palm. So you actually can't really grip it with your fingers and you can have the same exact arm speed, but the ball will just come out 10, 15 miles per hour slower. Um, so that dead ball becomes absolutely devastating when divers or sorry when serve receivers have to dive forward and that when they don't expect it yeah and I, I think we're even starting to see this a lot with like i know andy uh banesh has kind of developed this with a of a, a um a topspin kind of serve mm -hmm. 
where he'll he'll go through a couple, he'll rip down down the line, down the seam, he'll get a couple serves that way, and then he'll look the exact same, except now he'll open that hand up and go throw that dead ball, and it's it's really hard to pick up on. Um, I call it the oh crap serve, you know, because most of the time as I'm a passer, I'm like, oh crap, you know, I got to go get it too. Most of the time I don't say crap, but, you know, I've already talked it. about guns today. I know where you're coming from. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I wonder if it has to do with, uh, like, I think, you know, I'm trying to think of some way we could do it without without people seeing. And I think a lot of it, if you're going through that hard serve, you know, the one that's catching people high on the neck, um, I'm trying not to use a visual, but so with this water bottle, you know, like a lot of times when we make our contact, it's here. But with mm. that hard serve, you're almost going to make it feel like you're hitting this side of the ball. Um, I got you. You know, yeah. so it's like you're following through a little yeah, more. So it's like when that ball absorbs, like it's your job to, you're not going to swing all the way through, but you're going to try to touch this side of the ball, you know? And I think with that dead ball that you're talking about, you're maybe only going halfway, you know, or maybe even a quarter or something like that. So I think sure. like, it's all about the finish, you know, and this is something that I had written kind of down in my, in my, um, my keys. And I've, I've already seen somebody ask, how do you get a little bit more zip on the ball? Um, and I think that contact is huge. You know, I think um, if you can think about contacting the other side of the ball and, and almost surprising that volleyball mm -hmm. um, and really whipping it, then that's a way to get a little bit more zing on that ball. If we're talking about that serve that we talked about before um, with the high, fast, fast, flat float serve. Um, but if you're going for that dead ball, then obviously you're not gonna you're not gonna surprise that ball as much. You're not gonna go through that full contact that you were looking for before, and instead you're kind of you're still surprising, but then you're kind of laying off it at the end. Yeah, we talked a lot about that today when people were hitting uh, their high lines. They're moving their arms too slow into the high lines. And I said, you move your arm just as fast. Like if I'm going to punch my hand, if I continue to go through it, it's going to make that hard sound. But I can move it just as fast, but just stop it on contact. And it's not going to make my hand go anywhere. It's not going to do that damage. Mm -hmm. So that speed until you contact the face. And then you got to stop that hand right there. And that that's a good way to use that dead ball and uh, to hit shots in general. Yeah. Now let's talk about kind of really going into this chess match of how do I beat a passer or sorry, how do I beat a bad setter or how do I beat somebody who I really know, like loves to charge and hit if they can get under the ball frequently, there's, there's a couple ways. Now you can beat a setter by serving the other player, but if you keep serving the player at an even distance, so say we use that flat float, and they don't have to move. The setter only has to set a ball that's moving maybe 10 feet, right? Because they've passed this person's pass from three quarters depth. They pass it up to six feet. You're really only talking about seven, eight feet that the setter has to focus. Now, if I want to make a setter nervous, if I know that they suck, that they get nervous, that their hands fall apart, they think too much, they double a lot. I'm going to pop a high deep serve. And this is what we talked about when we said that the flat serve lands deep, but I don't consider it a deep serve. The high deep serve is if everybody at home puts their arms out like so that their body makes a T. When you're in serve receive, what you want this high deep serve to do is land up and over that fence, but still in the court, right? What that's going to do is it's going to, well, it's going to tempt somebody to try to tomahawk, in which case you've won the first battle. If somebody tomahawks and serve receive, server, you have won the first battle. Congratulations, right? Or if they're a better passer, they're going to move back. They're going to put their feet probably on that back line just to be able to contact the ball at their platform. And now I've doubled the distance of the pass. And now this setter, really, if there, even if there's a little bit of a breeze, this setter just starts to freak out, right? Because the ball is moving so far. And now the passer has to send a long, like a 20 foot pass to get it into the right zone, or they can leave it at half court and make it easier for the setter. In which case, well, now you're attacking a ball where the set's coming from half court. So I know statistically I'm already at an advantage. Right. Or if they do get the ball all the way forward, then they're passing that long ball and the setter gets really nervous. And now most people charge 
the more time you give a hitter, the earlier they tend to get, which is kind of crazy. So once you send them deep, the time before their between their pass and their hit is going to be a lot longer than it normally is. And they're going to have a tendency to get early. They're going to lose their vision. They're going to lose power, right? So if you want, if you know that somebody's getting early, you just pop. And and it seems silly to use the serve because you're literally you're putting a rainbow, soft serve high deep in the court. You're hitting it up to get it over that player's head and force them to move back or tomahawk. And once you do that, you're already at an advantage, and you're not going for an ace. You're going to cause a bad set and a troublesome attack. So now we're thinking three and four touches in advance instead of like what we said at the beginning. Yeah, I'm going to get a serve. Oh, crap. He passed it really well. Now my plan is in pieces, and I don't have the next phase of my strategy. But this is that next phase. Serve that ball high, slow, deep. Force the player to move back. Force a longer pass. You'll get a nervous, shaky setter. And the hitters will have a big tendency to come in early because they'll just be charging because you've elongated that time between pass and hit contact. Mm -hmm. And it, it does not matter what level you are playing at. You know, I've seen... I've seen people stress out after an easy pass that made them pass deep where they're a beginner. I've also seen Ricardo make some of the best players on the AVP look like fools because he serves this high, super easy ball deep into the court. And then that's when he starts getting a lot of his blocks or his defender starts getting really, really easy digs. Um, yeah. And I think it's as long as we can take that passer out of their comfort zone of where they like to pass in order to get themselves to their starting position for their approach. Um, a lot of people don't realize where that is. You know, they don't know where they should be starting their approach every single time. Um, so if you put them in a position that they're not used to passing, then they're not going to be able to find that starting position in any way. And like we were talking about where it's a charge, you're going to start seeing people pass from the deep the deep spot on the court. And then they're just going to have either this trot up to the net where they never get stopped. They never speed up. They never slow down, or they're literally just going to run as fast as they can. And they're going to hope that their setter makes them a perfect set, but because their vision is not the same as it would be on a normal pass, they're, they're kind of messing everything up. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, I like that. And, and I think the more, you can be okay because the passer isn't going to be the one that looks like they're in trouble right when the play is starting you know if you can kind of get that out of your head because when you serve that ball up it's almost going to feel like you underhand served it you know and yeah. when that passer is like looking at it they're almost going to look like they're passing an underhand float serve but all the trouble starts happening after that pass happens because yeah. now we're thinking about the set and the hitter as well you know and one advantage that i also just thought of is when you hit a slow softball at certain players, they're mentally, they relax because they think they're no longer under pressure. So their technique slides, their platform kind of relaxes. Uh, they get a little bit jelly in the arms. They might leave their hands early. They might exhale, but they're not in that tense. I need to be here at all times uh, mindset. So when you give that slow ball to a passer, even if it does end up right in their lap because you missed it short, a player just randomly falls asleep and they get the sloppy pass and then they get an even sloppier approach. And then you've won on that side too because you've changed their mentality from being engaged to them thinking they're in complete control and therefore relaxing. There are people who think they're in complete control and they know how to step on the, on the gas pedal. Right. And they keep that tension. But there are the types of players who, when you make them think they're in control with easy, slow balls, everything about their technique and their footwork and their spacing changes because they relax. And that's a good way to, to sort of nail them uh, with a couple of balls until, of course, they get pissed off enough and then they, they refocus. But you can get them one out of every, you know, four or five balls, just gets them not sleeping, 
but you can lull them to sleep. The old Robodope. <laughs> oh, it's hap- I mean, I think every volleyball player can say that it's happened to them. You know, their mm-hmm. partner's under stress for the entire game. Your partner's getting served the whole time, and all of a sudden, it's four. It's twenty seventeen, and then they serve you a ball. You know, and you're like, oh crap! Like now, it's I'm not setting anymore. Now I have to pass and hit and kind of just catching them off guard. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a good point too. I think the last one I want to talk about is uh, is short serves. Okay. So we did, we did talk about that dead ball, but now the fourth type of float serve. We got uh, flat and fast. We've got the high deep going over that back fence and in. Uh, we've got the dead ball, which comes in hot or looks like it's coming in hot and then drops. And then a little bit steeper short serve now sometimes this works because if you hit it a little bit up somebody's a little bit slower to it because they don't know if it's going for that high deep surf or if it's going to go short so their initial body movement is kind of standing up and rising which is going to instantaneously make them slower they might be slower to that and you can probably get this ball to fall steeper or closer to the net when this happens uh, because the angles work out better for you So now you can jam a hitter at the net, and this is for sure one of those plays that I'm I'm not expecting to get an ace on, but I am expecting to disrupt the hitter rhythm. People are incredibly bad at passing short float serves. It's shocking how if you can put a ball inside of 10 feet over and over and over again, you will win that battle on a very regular basis. And it's it's maddening for the team that's receiving. Uh, the, the passer can't balance themselves. They can't get back behind half court. Most of them will just pass, take one step back and sit there. In which case, if you don't get behind half court after I serve you a short float serve, I've taken out half of your approach. Like now I'm puppet master. You're my puppet. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm literally controlling the length of your approach, you know, by by serving that short ball. And then when you're under it or you don't get that full length approach, you have to look up at the ball instead of forward at the court. So the ball's not in front of you with the players in the background. So I've cut your vision. I've cut your approach height. I've cut your approach distance, which means you have a smaller setting window, which means that your setter has to be more perfect. And normally people don't know to just pass kind of, the short ball to pass kind of straight up. There's two different schools of thought on that. One of them is if you're in very much control, you can treat it like a free ball. Most pro players at this point are fast enough and practice that short serve enough to be able to send it over on to, right? When this happens at the double A or even the open regional level, when somebody attacks on two on a short serve, people just ditch their short float serve for the rest of the match they get one on two kill and then all of a sudden boom well i guess that'll never work they got an answer for it (laughs) they had one answer once right right and so to to say that i'm never going to short float serve again after one successful rep by the other team that is not the way to go. Put that pressure on them and explore that short serve. And you're most likely going to get either a block on a hard swing because they're trapped in their lower or a tape on a, on a hard swing, or you're going to get an easy shot. You can pretty much count on people shooting when they don't have that approach. Um, and that's a great time to run a bait and switch once you're in that situation. So that short, steep serve will pay dividends and John Mayer, a uh, great player, fantastic coach. When he was asked, what's the number one skill or number one, most underrated skill for volleyball players. He actually said the short surf. Hmm. And I, I have to say that I agree because I, I know that it's helped me relax through some matches that otherwise would have been much harder work just by popping in that really short surf. And people need to practice it instead of that high generic three quarter depth surf. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think being able to confidently hit that short serve not only will set you up for points when you're hitting that short serve, but then, um, sorry, but then. As you're 
developing that deep serve too now this is when that cat and mouse game comes into effect and to be honest like if you do not understand what the cat and mouse game is in beach volleyball or volleyball in general um you're missing out on a lot of fun because <laughs> that honestly probably is the only thing that has is keeping me in this game um i love the challenge of being in a position where you're not supposed to be in control of the match and then just because of your thoughts and intuition and what you're making the other side of the court do, you somehow become the person that's on offense. Um, I, think, I think a lot of it had to do with when I was a setter in college. Um, I didn't find the glory that all these hitters had with getting a big kill during a point. But for me, it was misdirection. You know, if I saw if I got the middle to go with the outside and then I set back or if I had no block, that was like the biggest compliment to me ever. You know, mm -hmm. um, and it's the same thing when you're talking about beach volleyball and serving is if you can make this person develop that frustration inside of them about not being able to get that short serve. And then right when they think they've cheated early enough to get that float, that that short serve, and now you pop them with a high deep. Now they're frustrated on a whole different level and they don't even know what their name is anymore. Uh, and I, I think like if you can kind of start figuring that out and start playing around with that and, and just realizing that it's not always about winning the point. It's about making that person shiver when they're back in serve receive, mm. you know, um, and we can do it with float serves. It's not only only jump serves, but Absolutely. yeah, yeah we haven't developed. even gotten into jump float, jump spike, all right. these variations of serves. And we haven't even talked about angles. Like line to line, right. what's better, serving line to line or serving angles? And we're not going to tell you guys today because we want you to come back for another episode. <laughs> tune, um, in, tune in next week. <laughs> but we will give you the real stats on which serves are more effective, line to line, middle to line, uh, cross serves. Uh, and, and we'll go over that in definitely in a, a different episode. But for today, we are beyond out of time, my man. I like it. That was a good yeah. one. Yeah. It was fun. And Crazy that's how much all you can standing talk about a float, float serves. <laughs> standing, standing float serves. Yep. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff. And you guys can see at the bottom and, of our screen. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so, Mark, for you, like I think a lot of people who are pros or anything, do you still use a standing float serve from time to time when you're playing? Oh, most definitely. Yes, I know I do. Um, yep. It's, I think, accuracy can be just as dangerous as power. Um, mm. And so I think uh, if you're an open level player, a pro level player listening to this and you don't feel comfortable with your standing close serve, you need to think about that too. It's not just for beginners or low intermediates. Yeah. Uh, and if you guys want to dive any deeper into this, so if you want uh, our team of coaches to be able to look at your serve technique, look at your serve strategy, and you want to take a full course designed to help you in getting a float serve, getting a jump float serve, getting a jump spike serve. We have all the drills that you can do at home or on your court, and we show you how to modify them in our course. It's called Power Accuracy and Aces, the serving masterclass. If you go to betteratbeach.com forward slash coaching, we have that course ready and waiting for you and you're going to upload all of your arm swing technique all of your footwork uh, and we're going to give you the exercises so that you can create better serves and then what's really cool about it is we can use your match or practice film or we can use the world tour film which we do a lot we use a lot of world tour and avp film and we do film study in our coaching group and that's where we really dive into the technique and tactics of it and we see where your game is in relation to where the pros is and really seeing those matches side by side on one screen can absolutely absolutely pay dividends in your game if you want to hit the next level if you're just looking for something let's say that you're out there you're a coach and you're looking for better feedback to give to your players. This is a great course for you and you have full access to us, which means that we meet on Zoom and we can give you tools to use with your players. I know we have several coaches who aren't even using it for them. They're using it so that they can be better coaches. And I think that's a great way, great way to utilize our programs. Um, and of course, if you wanna come and do it in person, April 3rd, we are in Florida. Uh, me and Brandon are leaving in 
four days to run two weeks of camp in St. Pete Beach, Florida, and we will be back there April 3rd to April 10th. And we have, we just got five spots booked today, randomly, just boom, five bookings. Uh, so I think we're down to now uh, 15 or 14, 14 spots. spots. Yeah. Yeah. So if you guys are interested, um, I got 14 spots left for April and you can find those at better at beach.com forward slash camps. And we will see you in Florida, April 3rd. I like it. Mm -hmm. Guys, thank you very much. I hope you guys got a lot out of this. Uh, if you're watching this episode anywhere, please go ahead and subscribe to this channel or this podcast. Please like it and just share it. Share it with some friends, share it with your team, share it with your partner. If you think you got a lot out of it, you're, whoever you're sending it to will be thankful. Don't send it to anybody you play against. We know how valuable this information is, uh, but uh, we very much appreciate those things. Where Even if you're not one of our uh, full coaching members or you've never come to a camp, a great way to support us and the people who work for us is to just share like subscribe that goes a long way to helping us to helping us grow and continue uh, offering free training like this so please go ahead and like share subscribe all right let's do some q a brother uh i'm i went to the bottom today and i'm gonna work my way up cool um do you guys have a list of local tournaments? Uh, AVPAmerica.com. I would say that's your best chance, Mark. That'll give you a whole list of all the tournaments going on. Uh, is AVP America with CBVA? I believe CBVA tournaments are on there now. Okay. Not but positive. I'm not sure. Yeah. So check out um, AVPAmerica.com and CBVA, California yeah, if Beach Volleyball Association. you're in California and you're looking for yeah. local CBVA tournaments, yeah. Um, I, this isn't a question, but Kyle Garahana, um, mm -hmm. something that you wrote at some point, and this was kind of when we first started talking about float serving, you wrote, get weird is the key. And, um, I think you need to find some consistency. I don't like the word weird when we're talking about serving, because I think it should be somewhat structured. Um, so I, uh, I think if, if you're trying a bunch of different stuff and trying to get the same result, you're going to run into some issues there. So I'll try to find something a little consistent. Um, Kyle, I'm not sure what you're, what you're saying there, but just want to make, just want to point that out just in case that's the He's point. been watching too many of my games. Yeah. <laughs> nine <laughs> right, different yeah. serves to get busted out. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, do you have pointers for adding some ump to my float? I feel like I can hit a spot or serve the ball hard, never both. Um, we kind of already talked about that. I think we kind of went back through, but, um, I think that that contact point one, having that really strong structure of your hand, allowing yourself to find that point. And then if you can think about, um, getting that ball through that, breaking the glass zone pretty mm -hmm. quick, I think that that's how you can find some umph. Um, I think a lot of times we're too worried that we're going to hit the ball long when as long as you cross the net at a right height, it's, it's going to be pretty tough for you. Um, so I would say concentrate on your contact point and um, trajectory. I think that, that that might be an easy fix there. Yeah, and practice spots with heat. So if you're hitting hard, don't just say, I'm going for a hard serve, right? You have to go for a hard serve with aim so many people just choose a jump serve because they want to jump serve or because they want to bring power and as soon as they decide to go for a jump spike serve they forget to aim for any spots like it doesn't make any sense you need to aim no matter how much heat you are trying to bring okay so don't choose one or the other make sure that you're locking in both and when you go for heat you don't just blindly go for heat. You still aim small, miss small. I like that. Uh, not a whole lot of questions. Yeah. Well, I do want to say, you know, a very special, like, hi to, to Atzel Bustamente. Thanks for watching. Says he's a huge fan of the channel. Really appreciate that. Appreciate the positivity and the support. Um, Mark Zen, I think, who has been here through every episode. Yeah, I like his name. 
really cool to <laughs> really cool to see um some repeat guys hanging out with us so thank you very much guys for coming again and, and being here live uh eduardo is going to see us in florida can't wait to hang brother and zach lucero is pumped he's pumped to learn and get better today zach really 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 appreciate that um it's like we said it's not fun if you guys aren't here and hanging out right. and engaging. <laughs> so uh, thank you. And uh, thank you for the comments. Uh, comments, believe it or not, it's a free way to help. That engagement helps us, helps our channel grow. Um, and if you share it, that's an even better way. Please, please, please share any of our episodes that you see. All right. I got a one little last shout out from my boy, Jeff, um, from VB. Um, I'm only two hours away from you. I'm up in Richmond. Um, but, um, any tips for cross court floats seems only a few indoor train ballers have this skill typically from a line to line or across the seam. Um, I think if you're having trouble, um, hitting this cross court ball i'm wondering if it has to do with depth or if you're not making it all the way to the sideline um i think one thing that a lot of us do is we try to be too tricky you know and we try to um we try to make that server for some reason think that we're not serving them rather than thinking about the location you know i think if, if you plan on serving cross court and you're starting in that zone one position or like the back right spot on the court where a lot of people start because that's like the serving position when you're a little kid. Yeah, they all serve the same. Um, yeah, before, if you don't know, you can serve from anywhere behind the behind the, the end line. Um, Jeff, I know that you know that. But um, whenever we're thinking about a cross court serve, instead of running straight down the line, I think we can we can go a little bit like almost like you're facing seam um, or even facing that cross court player. Yeah, you know, put it if you're facing that person. Sometimes it's okay for that person to know that you're serving them. You know, because then you're not really trying to trick them into thinking you're not serving them. You're you're trying to beat them in a way where you're putting the ball into a tough spot. So I think if we can get rid of this like no look kind of pass to the cross court, which it's I think that's what a lot of indoor players do if they're starting out on the beach. I think we can just face the middle of the court or even face that right side player and then as you go up, think about challenging them on their sideline, challenging them short and deep, like just like we talked about in this session. That's where I was going to go with that, is when people decide to serve diagonal, they hit the player again right in the chest. You know, if you make like a funnel shape towards that player, you know, where the, the triangle starts at you and it opens up to that player, you got to serve outside of that little triangle, their zone of influence to make them make big moves. You know, uh, one of the best cross-court serves is the one that uh, crosses the middle uh, in front of one player's eyes where he is almost tempted to take it but it lands in the other person's cross so like when it crosses the middle line between those two players instead of crossing it early you know in front of half court then you can really get them bickering at each other and and right. arguing but you want it to cross the face so that both players are tempted if you're using that diagonal seam serve serving diagonal isn't just serving diagonally at someone's chest that's literally the easiest serve possible because all they have to do is block the ball straight back to where it came from and it's going to be in the perfect passing zone you want them to have to fight a little bit harder and make bigger angles to in order to do that right and I also think it's just important to realize the dimensions of what you're dealing with now. You know, like if you're serving a line to line serve, that's that's going to be the quickest and the shortest distance possible for you to serve. You know, if you're serving that same ball to the cross court, then it's going to die shorter than you would want it to. So the longest distance that you'll have is from the right corner all the way to the cross court corner. And if you're trying to hit that ball, just realize that it's probably about three to four feet longer. I, I, I would actually, we just need to do that math, but there, it's a little bit, it's longer than it would be if you're serving straight sideline. So if you're going sh a short serve, it's gotta be a little bit harder than if you're going straight down the line. If you're going a deep serve, then it's gonna feel like you're hitting that ball pretty hard. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Hey. Somebody from Dutchie land, I love it uh when are we doing a video about attacking or offense i can see if i can look behind the scenes here 
uh, where our Ooh, we're next giving spoilers. One. Yeah, well, we'll give some spoilers. Uh, on the twenty seventh, we're going to talk about block defense, and on uh, actually January 29th, I think we're going to do how to plan and build your practices. And the next time I see that we have actual hitting is going to be uh, the middle of January. So, uh, Michael from Netherlands, uh, I think we're going to get into some attacking conversations in the middle of January. But if you want to dive into it right now and you want to start our offensive attacking courses, we have them already waiting for you. Better at beach.com forward slash coaching. And it, you can meet with us video zoom meeting not just a chat here but actually uh meet with us and really talk about and learn that plus everybody who's in our coaching program has full access to every video private lesson we've ever done everything we've ever filmed all in one library it would be shocking to know that what's on YouTube is less than half of the content that we have built. So uh, we have a ton of these lessons just ready and waiting for you uh, at betteratbeach.com forward slash coaching. I like it. <clears throat> All right, man. Well, All right. I got to go make some cookies. <laughs> well, send some my way. <laughs> uh, Mama Boo, is, uh, she's been slaving away. Oh, and. Nice. Uh, she's got brownies. She's got date nut bars. She's got cookies. Uh, if any of you guys want to send cookies our way, you can uh, send them right to the postcard in St. Pete Beach, <laughs> and we will eat them up. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, but yeah. hey, Merry Christmas if I don't talk to you. You too, man. And I'll see you down in Florida. And Merry yeah. Christmas to, or happy holidays to everybody else out there. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas to all of you. Steve Gerard, thanks for saying hi, man. And uh, that's it. That's our show for all today. Right. Love you guys. All right. Later, Brent. See ya.